All right. Well, Dave, it is fantastic to finally be able to sit down with you face to face, just the two of us, Mm -hmm. because last time we were on a call, we were doing a presentation for anchored members, uh, which I'm going to actually attach here. I don't usually do that. I don't typically put in Zoom presentation, audio or audio and visual into podcasts, but it was so educational that I feel like listeners would really benefit from listening to it or tuning in if you're on YouTube right now. But let's start a little bit uh, or let's dive into a little bit about you because I know a whole lot about bugs right now, but not about you. So (laughs) so why don't you talk to me about um, the the basics? Where were you born and raised? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, born and raised um, outside of Buffalo, New York, actually. And uh, 1974, so I'm 49, um, and uh, I spent about, I don't know, in that, along Lake Erie is where we lived, so I could actually see Lake Erie from our, from our house. But I was, uh, I'm one of three brothers, right? So I have an older and a younger, I'm in the middle. Uh, my dad is, first was first generation in this country uh, from Austria, uh, came over in about 1950, and um they already had family over in, in New York, so that's where they kind of ended up. And um, we kind of lived in that area for, I don't know, for until I was a teenager. And then I went off to college and then I ended up in Pennsylvania, where we also had roots. My mom's side of the family lived in Erie, Pennsylvania, along Lake Erie as well. So um, kind of between those two places, spent summers in Erie on the farm and, um, you know, went to school in, in New York as a young kid. So, um, my, it's funny, I, I listened to your, uh, deck Hogan podcast and he said something that I tell everybody and it was m- my earliest memories are fish. And I, I don't, however far you can think back in your childhood and, you know, you don't remember, you know, the first time you tied your shoes or walked, or at least I don't, <laughs> yeah. but I, the, the oldest memory I have is fishing and, um, you know, fishing with, with uh, my dad and uh, brothers, and uh, I can remember the place. I can see it like it was yesterday, and I, that's my earliest memory. Where and, was, uh, it? was it? That was on, uh, you know, it was on a lake. It was uh, bait fishing, probably under a barber, and uh, it was uh, Chautauqua Lake, which is like uh, New York, uh, right over the New York Pennsylvania border. Um, and it was a large mob bass, like I don't know. When you're a kid, it, they're all big, right? So, yeah. you know, when you're, <laughs> when you're older, it's your hands are bigger and stuff. So it's probably smaller. But yeah, it's my first memories was was catching a, my first real fish. You know, that was pretty cool. So, <laughs> and what, what about fly fishing? Were you fly fishing then, or did that come into the no. mix later? So, as a kid, uh, as a kid, I was obsessed with like three things, and it was fishing with my dad was first, Aww. and then um, I played music my dad also played music and skateboarding so those three things ran my life like and to this day probably those three things still run my life i skateboarding I, love them all. Still? I roll around a bit um i have a skateboard here with a cicada <laughs> on it uh but yeah uh i don't not 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 at all like i used to and stuff but uh yeah so those three things really ruled my life and um my first fly fishing experience was pretty cool. It was, um, my dad took me to an outdoor show in New York, in Buffalo. And I, we used to always go to that. And we always look forward to it. And it was always, it was always, it was the kind of show where, uh, and you've seen them probably where every outfitter from Northern Canada was there and they had all their mounts of all these big fish and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it, it was one of those. So as a kid, you know, maybe 10 to 12 years old or so, we used to go to those things. And it was always so, you know, just blown away by all these faraway places and these big giant fish and everything. And I remember there was a fly casting demo and it was actually uh, Kathy Beck who was there. So Barry and Kathy Beck from Pennsylvania as well. And she was casting and I went over to their table with my dad and I was super interested in fly fishing. Um, And my, she actually gave me a couple flies in a little box. Aww. and like gave them to me and my dad bought me a south bend fiberglass rod reel you know what kind with like the foam handle and the solid fiberglass like not even hollow but like that kind of rod yeah um like the like a kit you know and I was just 
I was I was in it. And I remember he, he must have known, my dad must have known somebody who fly fished because he came home from work one day with a stack of books. And one of them was like um, fly fishing strategy or something. Larry Solomon, I think it was. And it was like a big paperback thing, black and white. And I just paged through this thing like constantly. And I was in love with this book. So I, it was Atlantic Salmon and Steelhead and uh, fly tying. It was all like the classic stuff, like uh, lead wing coachmen's and things like that and, and all that, all that stuff. And uh, so I got into it and I remember like, just, I, I taught myself, I didn't, I didn't have anybody who knew um, that taught me to cast or anything. So I went out the front yard and just like read those books and figured it out. And I, I don't know, I don't think it was any good, but um, then I remember taking that rig to my so I, I mentioned my mom's family was was from Erie and they had a farm and the the next farm over had this pond and they we used to go over there and swim and fish it was full of fish and I remember uh taking it over there and like just, just flailing on the water you know with the thing and um and then catching, you know, some fish, didn't know what I was doing, but, you know, caught fish on flies, but that was it. I was like, I was over it. Like that, that's all I wanted to do. And where we lived around Lake Erie. So you're, you're familiar, obviously with like, we had migratory rainbows and you call them steelhead or not. I don't, you know, I don't think they're steelhead. I think they're <laughs> migratory rainbows, but they, they are fun. I can tell you that. And when you can catch 20 a day, it's pretty awesome. But, um, we had those, but actually in the, in the seventies and eighties, so sort of put me in the, probably in the middle eighties, there was still the salmon program that kind of failed in Lake Erie. It was cohos. So they, mm. they stocked cohos from the sometime in the seventies up until very early 1990s, I think. But they were, it was, it was, you know, back then it was like snagging was legal and all this stuff. So it was just slaughter. Like it was crazy. Um, but there was also some, some rainbows. And so there was, I don't know if they just like started playing with steelhead in those days or whatever, but there was some rainbows still. And you, you would, you would find those. And I remember my very first trout on a, on a fly was uh, actually a lake run, like migratory steelhead rainbow, whatever you want to call it. And it was on a, <laughs> it's funny. It was on a sunken dry fly. I, like I said, didn't know what I was doing at all. Right. So I, I remember there was this ledge and I, you know, I assumed there would be fish there and I drifted this thing through and it was just not floating dry fly. Like I didn't know any better. It sunk through and I watched the, the green level fly line dart like under the ledge. And I was like, something must have took it. And I set the hook and it just all hell, hell broke loose. And that was it. And of course, back in those days, we were meat fishermen, so we ate everything and took Girl, it home and stuff. Rock yeah. shampooed it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My 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 dad, my my grandfather, they they loved fishing. My dad loved fishing, and that was that was it. And it was pretty easy to always just uh, persuade him to go fishing. Like, sure, we can go. <laughs> and and I I remember begging him that day, take me fishing, and we went, and I, I caught that fish, and it was that was it. I was. I was just, I was fly fishing from then on, but I, you know, obviously gear fish and everything else too. So did you have an interest in bugs that, you know, early on or did it come later? That came a little bit later. Um, like I said, didn't know what I was doing. Then, you know, it started to consume everything, read everything you could get your hands on. I remember like some very early issues of fly fishermen and fly rod and reel at the time and fly tying magazine and stuff. And this would have been, Late 80s, early 90s, probably more on the late, uh, early or uh, late 80s. Um, but bugs, I, I eventually probably made that connection that this stuff imitates bugs, <laughs> right? Um, but the first experience, and, I, and I, I write a little bit about this in my book, just my first experience with bugs was mm -hmm. um, probably, probably in the early 90s then. Uh, I went fishing and um, I showed up to the, to the creek and there was fish rising everywhere and and there was 
these moths like in the air they weren't moths they were caddis but they they i thought they were moths at the time and i was like what the heck and from that point i was thinking about this the other day i was like um you'd see a fish jump you know as a kid you'd be like he's they're jumping they're jumping and that was the moment where it went from fish are jumping to they're rising they're eating something like that's what they're doing i thought fish jumped because they were happy or something else but they were eating and and i saw it and i was like what the heck so you know just like just like you see like i caught a bug and i was like what the heck is this thing and I looked in my box and i had nothing like it and failed you know didn't didn't catch a thing and then I was like that was pretty cool and boy if you if you had the fly i know that's why people fly fish if you had the fly that could do that you would catch fish so you know got a got a copy of the caddis and the angler some set a library or something and i was like that's the bug i saw and and then i went back and um had some new flies and caught fish and like that was it and then it was from that point forward start to really know what this fly fishing thing was about and for me it was almost from the beginning dry flies because you could see it yeah i think it was the draw like i think it was uh like you know fish under the water chasing stuff or eating stuff but it was just that whole visual piece of it It was like there there's a bug floating and you're placing bets right you're like one's going to eat it. Oh, there he goes. And it's still to this day, you know, we sit there, sit there by the river and watch bugs go by and are like, why didn't he eat that one? What, you know, or why did they choose that one? So yeah, dry flies. <laughs> so you mentioned your book. I've mentioned your book. We're here to talk yeah. a lot about your book. Let's just dive, sure. dive right into the book. So yeah. what's the story behind the book? Were you an author before? Nope. So, so just lead me through the, through the story, if you don't mind. Yeah, this is funny. So, um, so fast forward all that stuff to, to like being, um, totally in on like fly fishing was it and dry flies were everything. And then stumbling on my first cicada periodical cicada emergence, um, was somewhere in the nineties, you know, married, had kids, young kids at the time and uh went up to the like sneaking away to the river just for an hour or two and was like what the heck there's fish rising everywhere and and there's these huge bugs what the heck is this lo and behold start looking around cicadas i was like oh wow this is this is next level two inch bug like and there's catfish eating them cat carp eating them everything else um and and so that started it and from there it was learn about this thing um and we're you know being in pennsylvania so had now living in pennsylvania the full time since since college i went to penn state um huge entomology department at penn state big names there um guys who fish and guys who studied cicadas <laughs> are there so you know picking uh picking their brains calling george uh, uh Greg hoover and um talking to some of the other guys and Joe Humphreys and then the local fly shops over there back. And this would have been back in the early nineties and starting to learn about this stuff. Um, so over the years, it was like, well, this doesn't happen very often. It happened somewhere. Let's go find it. And so my, my friends and I, who were, you know, the, the, the regular group of guys that fish together, we're like, we got to hunt this down, figure this out, find play, find where it's going to be. You know, and the cicada is a terrestrial insect. So it's very unlike our trout bugs, right? That come out of the river. Cicadas come out of the ground on dry land. So it's a mat, it's a, it's an additionally, <clears throat> maybe a little complex that you got to find where the, where, ge where geographically they are, but geographically near water in numbers that can be fished so over the years started to figure this stuff out reading i mean i have i have a mountain of scientific journals and white papers and everything about cicadas over the years just to find out where we're going to have good fishing and hunting it down and no one else doing it like no like maybe people do, have done it by chance um, and stumbled across it like I did that one time, but um, you know, year on year, like we are chasing it, 
and going, driving multiple states and, and stuff to find it. So how did the book come about? Um, was all that, all that work, all that research and all that figuring it out and being successful at it. And, and, you know, taking time in the middle of winter going next year's a big year. It's going to be in Virginia where start looking at Google earth and things like that and digging things out on the internet and figuring it out. So I was talking to a friend of mine and said, um, someone said, Oh, we should write a book. And I said, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I want to tell anybody all about this stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I was like, ah, you know what? We could do that. We could write a book because when we, when we were first doing this and, and hunting for this information, it was literally trips to the library. It was, there was not the powerful internet we have today. So when you think of periodical cicadas being on a 17 year cadence, um, the first ones I fished were in the nineties. Now the nineties internet was very, very early. Right. <laughs> so there wasn't this availability that we had, we had to go and go and like, literally that's why I have these white papers and scientific journals and everything else. So you had to go look for it at libraries and figure it out and, and all that. Well then as years go on. So 2008, was a pretty big cicada year in central Pennsylvania. And before that, there wasn't a lot of information online, right? There, but now 2008, lots of information. The next one's 2025 and it takes us beyond where we are today with information everywhere. I have to, so, I have to take, I have to stop you for a second because I yeah. know there are people right now with questions and I'm going to just get them <laughs> picked off right away. Periodic, sure. Periodical cicada, oh. what is that? Yeah. Periodical cicada. Great, great question. Um, and then I'll jump back to answering your first question. Uh, periodical cicada is, uh, so periodic is it happens on a regular predictable cadence. Periodical cicadas, because of evolution, billions of years and uh, climate and geographic shifts that created the Great Lakes, Periodical cicadas are about from the midpoint of the United States east. And they only exist. It's so weird that it, they're bound by country specific borders, but periodical cicadas, there's a 13 year cycle cicada and there's a 17 year cycle cicada. Um, and these will occur in huge numbers in their emergence year. So that's periodic. So it has to recur at a, a regular interval with predictability. The other side is annual cicadas. So annual cicadas more or less happen every year, but not in necessarily predictable numbers. Oh, okay. And we have those everywhere. You have them in Australia and New yeah. Zealand big time. Um, there's annual cicadas every year and some years it's really good. And some years it's like, yeah, there's a few bugs around. Mm -hmm. Same thing in um, across the West, um, the Green River has annual cicadas two species that happen every year but again it's like is it going to be a good year or is it going to be an okay year and uh so it's uh varied predictability on numbers gotcha. so thank you for the helps. clarification big time it does thank yeah you. sorry so, to interrupt you no it's good so uh the book back to back to the book then it was so we did all this all we had this collection of and i say we because when you read my book it's a lot of we i don't like really write this from Certainly it's my voice, but like I included everybody like that was part of my mission with this was there are so many people that that, you know, I found the other people that are nuts about cicadas and I included them and everything else. And I felt like that was like my job to do somewhat with this. So I say we a lot. Um, so when when I came around to, to doing this book, you know, we got all this information together and was like, you know, we we've had really good success finding it, predicting it and timing it. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into kind of figuring out when's going to be the day they all kind of pop. So I wrote, I went online and well, so first I looked at my, my fishing bookshelf and I was like, every book says stack pull books. And I was like, okay. And then I looked them up and it's like the number one biggest sporting library there is. And I was like, makes sense to me. And I said, well, you know what? I'll write a submission. And a submission is if you go to any book publisher's website 
it has submission guidelines and they'll tell you um, to submit your work. Um, you need a table of contents, you need a sample chapter, X amount of words, um, why you're credible to do this and everything else. So it took like, I don't know, two or three days and wrote that up and um, I click send and it comes back and it says, uh, you know, we see a lot of these, you got six or eight months, we'll call you back. Like, but we'll let you know either way, but six or eight months, what's going to take like three days later, we get an email from, from Jay Nichols. Um, he's like, the big I've, yeah, he's like, I've been waiting for somebody to do this. Uh, let's talk. And then within a week, I think I had a contract on my desk and then I was like, guess I'm writing a book. <laughs> Whoa, that's, so, that's a big jump, a very successful big jump. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so then what happened? And when you said that you had all this data, I mean, did you have journals and you said oh, yeah. you had obviously all the papers and yeah. everything. Yeah. So, so you really were ready to put this all into a book. At that yeah. Point. Yeah. And, and, the, and actually some of the catalysts for this actually was that we, had, so this all like 2019. So I mentioned the periodic cicadas. So where I live, 2019 was a was a really big emergence right where I sit and the trees in my yard were covered with cicadas so and I have I sit between three different rivers within a mile that converge um out, where, out here and then two of those rivers have reservoirs so it was like there's lakes rivers everything and like I had like just a playground for a month and a half of fishing every day and and for with these giant bugs and um 20 2019 was a big year 2020 was a big year somewhere else and a friend of mine who actually wrote a, a contributed a piece of the book around lake fishing uh bob bell he 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 got the idea like let's go down to virginia and find it figure it out so two trips down to virginia and we figured it out and then 2021 was a big year again back in Pennsylvania. So we had three years in a row that it was just like cicada, cicada, cicada. And then 2022, I spent time in the West because I wrote about some of the stuff in the West on the green and in Colorado and, and things chasing annual cicadas um, there in an off year of periodicals. So planning around it like, and saying like if we're going to do this book i got to go and do some of this stuff and and again and you know i've seen some of it done of some of it before but um you know for purposes of getting good photos and everything else and just plain old fishing so yeah that's that's kind of how the, so then it was like an overdrive like it was just cicada after cicada year after cicada year for a short period and um it was like yeah it's like we've kind of figured this out in in with some predictability and like our patterns were tuned and um you know the fishing lakes was was probably like one of the big learnings since 2019 we fished a lot of rivers before that but then chasing it on lakes was was the last probably three emergences would, and then we kind of said you know we kind of chased this thing around a bit i guess you know it's a good time to to maybe get it together and then you know i also saw quite a bit of misinformation going around and that kind of like like I was like no that's wrong that's wrong no uh like you, like I what you have you have to share uh, some of this. yeah what, I what mean what were you, you hearing you, like I'd see fly I don't shops. even know who just the one no 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 totally um I'd see fly shops advertising like uh when we had brood x was a big one going on the, the, the periodical cicadas are named in broods by roman numerals and uh, Brood X was happening and, and like fly shops who weren't even in the range of w distribution of like geography where Brood X was going to be were like advertising it and they had t-shirts printed and stickers and I was like, you're not going to have those bugs there. And when I talked to people, they're like, oh, they haven't gotten here yet. They're not here yet. And I was like, they're never coming. How do you think they get there? I don't know. They fly there. And I was like, uh, no, they come from the ground and like literally the the nymph version of a cicada underground for 17 years never leaves a one meter cube of its whole life <laughs> and so they're not getting anywhere and then when they emerge they don't fly miles they fly 
to another tree in that area. And that's how those broods kind of get contained in a very like defined area. Right. So, so when I find them on the beach in Australia and they are enormous, yeah. by the oh, way. Oh, yeah. How are, I always assumed that they had flown and got knocked down or a bird had, you know, tried to eat yeah. it. Or, but I, I will only find one or two at a time. What's happening yeah. there? Do you know? So, so those are an, those are an annual variety. So again, oh, more right. more or less in every year, you're going to see some, maybe, maybe you see more than others. They're not as prolific as these periodicals. When I, when I say prolific, so there was a study of, uh, I think Penn State shared, and they said there, there could be over a million bugs in an acre. So when you, you see a really good spinner fall of mayflies, you think that's a lot of bugs. That's a lot of bugs over that riffle that it's happening at. You could have billions of bugs across the hillside. Uh, along a river of cicadas when it's happening so so that's period periodical is very prolific and that's funny I, we like when someone went um and I, i'm not i'm not, not a jerk or any trying to be a jerk but someone yeah. says oh fishing was epic the, the the thing that that trips my what definition of epic is is like 300 carp on cicadas in a couple days is epic. You know, that that's my, that's like my definition of like, and I don't want to impose that on anybody, but everybody has their own like version of epic, but that's, that's epic to me. And, and back to your question about like the beat, the cicadas you find on the beach, those are annuals. So they, they definitely emerge somewhere nearby and okay. yeah, they, they, they maybe, you know, they did, they're definitely, big bugs, air resistant, and wind does knock them around. That's how we get to fish them so well as they get knocked in the water by wind. Um, but they definitely emerge somewhere near, near there. So when you go look around and you find them on the beach, find like where your biggest trees are, your big mature trees. And that's where you're going to find other signs that cicadas emerge there. And the, those other signs are going to be um, the cicada comes out of the ground crawls up a tree as the nymph and then just like if you've ever seen a stone fly come out of its shell right they crawl up on a rock and they like break the wing case open and start to pop out cicada does the exact same thing but they do it on a vertical surface on a tree telephone pole whatever so a few signs there you'll see a little hole in the ground probably the size of um maybe I'm trying to do millimeters for you, like, That's like okay. 15, 15 millimeters, uh, okay. half an inch or so, right? Uh, 15 millimeters. And then um, they'll, they'll crawl all like from three feet to or a meter to all the way up in the canopy. And then you'll see the little casing clung to the tree for a few days. It'll just stay there. I have them here at my you place. You do? Yeah, the big they, casing stuck there, but it's not, it's not a bunch of them though. It'll just be a uh, few randoms. Yeah, yeah, and that's how it can be. Yeah. So, do annual cicadas travel farther or move more than periodical? And if not, what is the typical life cycle of a cicada? In general? Yeah. So, there's two two big questions there. So, okay. so we'll start with the first so, one. Do they move differently? They um, th so they're they're interrelated here. So. The males are the only ones that sing. They make noise. And what that does is attract females to them. And it also attracts other males over there because they know there's going to be females over there. So they will, we've, we've seen them cross the river, you know, a big river, whatever. Um, as far as like, hey, I'm going to go on a flight to find a mate and I'm going to go a mile down the road. I doubt it. I don't think they travel that far. Okay. Um, they'll buzz around a, a few hundred meters. Um, but what they're going to do is they're going to set up. So into the life cycle of this. So, and I'll, I guess I can start there. So the males sing to attract a mate and they're going to go somewhere high in the canopy and start singing. And then more males are going to go there and females are going to go there. And then everybody's going to start singing. So what you're going to find is concentrated areas of lots of noise. And that's going to be cicadas attracting mates. So they're going to start to congregate in a area. 
and it's arbitrary. It's just like wherever they started and then like, Hey, another one showed up and then another one and then a bunch more. And you can find sometimes like when you're, you're fishing on the river, you'll come around the river bend and it's screaming on one side of the bank, one side of the river and nothing over there. And then you go around another river bend and it's dead silent. And, and that's a lot of our late summer fishing here is, and it's for smallmouth bass usually, um, but August, September, just fantastic. And, and you can find, you know, you'll be like, holy cow, they're, they're way up in sycamores on the river, really high in there. You, you, it sounds like almost like periodical scream and there's got to be a hundred and 200, maybe a thousand bugs in one tree. So that's what they'll do. And so they'll, they'll, the males will sing, attract a mate. Once they find a suitable mate, male, female does their thing. A female goes off to another mature tree or finds a limb on that tree. Um, and what they do, the, the, the female possesses an ovipositor, which is some anatomy that basically can actually dig into young bark. So they'll, they'll choose like new growth or like the terminal ends of a tree, which is like the newest growth from spring. And that bark's like soft, right? So they'll dig in there and they'll deposit 10 or 20 eggs and keep moving, dig in some more and, and, and deposit eggs. Five, 600, 700 eggs or so. And then it's kind of over. After the males mate, they hang around for a little, little bit more and they you know, still do their thing, try to do their thing. The female's kind of done after she's, she's out of eggs. And that then they kind of like- do they die? Yeah, yeah. Like, like within days, they they start to they start to fade and and die. And you'll see them doing weird things. You'll see them like just erratically flying around, and like you'll you'll see like they're not very agile anymore, and they'll like just fly straight into a tree or or whatever. And you know they're they're just kind of dying. After just about a week, eight to ten days, the eggs form very quickly into larvae. And then those eggs actually drop to the ground. And if you look really closely at the earth, it's full of cracks and things like that. And they just find their way down and they just keep burrowing and burrowing and burrowing. And, and the key, the key with the larva and everything else and, and why she puts her eggs in that new growth is the whole cicadas food, all their food is, is the sap from trees. So you, when you cut into a tree, it, you know, oozes some sap. That's the initial feed for the, the eggs and to turn them into larva. And then the larvas eat that. They go down into the earth and they spend their whole life basically sucking on roots. So if you look at a cicada's anatomy on their front end, they have this long straw and that's it. That They, they have no mouth. They have this straw and that straw pokes into roots and, suck some juice and then just move around and live within a meter cube typically right at the tree's roots. So is that why the adults die after because they stop feeding or is there another reason? Yeah, just their, their life cycles complete. No, they, they don't feed actually. T typically adult cicadas, some annual varieties, scientists say they do feed, they drink some water and things like that. And you, in, in another kind of point here is the periodical varieties they live it's about a month maybe four to six weeks um, and you can have some cooler weather that may extend it and they'll just kind of tuck themselves in under a leaf or trees and just wait for warmer weather to do their thing annual cicadas live a little bit longer because less numbers uh, gives them more time to find a mate and, and do their thing. But right. yeah, their life cycle is, is, is not unlike your salmon, right? They, yeah. they, they're adults for a very short time. Um, they morph, right. Just like our salmon do and morph with wings and big red eyes and they do their mating. And once they're depleted, they're depleted and, and that's it. Right. And it's over. Why yeah. do they sing in waves? Yeah. Why do they sing in waves? That's, that's just the, the chorus of what you hear when you hear a big congregation of males. So when they're really congregated under one tree or own group or one grove of trees, even um, you'll, you'll hear them sink and it'll be the dominant tones. But if you, if you get right in there and listen, you'll, you won't hear the waves. You'll usually hear the waves at a distance because it's the dominant effect oh. of like 
groups of them kind of in sync. <laughs> right. That That's actually makes cool. that makes sense. So how does one chase periodical hatch? <laughs> I'm giving all my secrets. Uh yeah. So you buy the book and, <laughs> and you and you read up on that. Uh, no, you no, it's um it's um it takes a little work. So um there's a significant amount of like I'd say pre-scouting. And then there's like actual in the field scouting. And then, you know, and some of that can even lead into like, we're fishing now, um, just as an example. So I mentioned 2019 was right here where I sit, uh, pretty big, uh, periodical emergence. And, uh, I expected it. And I, and I said, this, this should be pretty easy. It's right in my backyard. And, um, so what I did was, you know, I was, I looked at the distribution maps and distribution maps I have in my book, but they're all over the internet as well. And you, you kind of look for where these distribution maps are data over years and years and years. So scientists was like, here's as far as we saw this brood north and here's as far as we saw it east and west and so on. So you look at those and you go like, wow, I'm sitting right in the middle of it. And then I start to look for waterways. Well, of course, in my own locale, I know where, where the waterways are. Um, but if I didn't, it's a lot of, used to be a lot of uh, big old paper gazetteer maps, right? Yeah. Um, and that, and now it's Google Earth is like a great tool. Um, and then you start looking at lay overlaying those things. So brood distribution maps and then waterways and going, wow, there's a, and looking for big mature forests. These are a bug that needs big mature trees. So you start looking at that and like it's in the it's in the right area for distribution and it's near big water and there's big trees. So you look at that and you go, okay, now we got to take a ride. So let's say it's a new new place and or you're just not sure if it's there. Uh, so for for the periodicals, it's pretty actually easy to like time of year, it's going to be May, June, uh, just because the Eastern half of the United States, that's where summer would happen. Now we can talk, we'll talk about annual stuff as well and, and the timing there, but there's some key factors. Um, so summer solstice is June 20th, June 21st or so. What's that longest day of the year? Longest period of sunshine. And, and, a, and a sprinkled like kind of through our conversation, but definitely in detail in the book is sunshine is very important. Uh, the bugs are affected by temperature. So we talked about singing. Um, they can only sing when they're warm. They won't sing on a cold rainy day, but two o'clock in the afternoon when it's 90 out is going to be your loudest singing. But they will crazy. hatch on a cold day. Is that they will? Right? They actually emerge at night. Yeah. Oh, but okay. the key, the key there is, is 64 to 68 degrees of soil temperature. So 64, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And scientists say at a depth of eight inches or so is going to be triggering emergence. Okay. So as closer you get to those warm days of summer is when you're going to see periodicals. Now in the Southern U S it's going to be a little earlier where I sit. Uh, the peak is around summer solstice, but you know what? It's just crazy because it climate change and chasing this for 30 years, we've seen it happen in earlier, just warmer. It's been warmer. So um, I'm curious to, to look at our previous ones because we're coming up on some of the ones that we really spent time on. 2025 will be the, the next time uh, brood XIV hits central Pennsylvania, which you should come visit because that's going to be a definition of epic. Um, it was 2008 was the last time. And that was the peak of that was summer solstice. So it'd be interesting to see if it's earlier or on same cadence right, as, as it is. And, and when's it due? Which year? 25. Wow. Yeah. Okay, then we'll be watching okay. that. Yeah, um, we will. <laughs> but so say down here in the southern hemisphere. So I've yeah. decided today I'm gonna go chasing the periodical yeah. cicada cicada. You don't so, have them there. 
We don't? don't have no, no. Oh, how do you periodicals how do you, how do you are you only know? in this eastern half of the U.S. And why is that? Yeah, so uh, science uh, scientists say there was a parent group of cicadas somewhere in that part of the United States before it was the United States, and then climate change, ice ages, things like that, and then plate shifts, glacial slides took some of those bugs and moved them here and some of those bugs and moved them here and everywhere else. And there's theories on this. That's what's cool about these bugs is there's mysteries. Like no one really knows yeah, lots of it. mysteries. Yeah, I know. And, and, and it's Halloween, right? So it's like fits right in. <laughs> um, <ooh. laughs> um, so yeah, these mysteries with cicadas, they believe glacial shifts, the, the glaciers that made Great Lakes and deposited stuff here and there and everywhere else moved cicadas because they're in that top layer of soil, right? So moved them around and then those became just through evolution, distinct broods, what they call them, of that species. And it's, it's in a contained geographic area. So how many broods are there? Yeah, so there's 13 year and 17 year, and there's uh, 12 broods that are 17 year and, and three that are 13 year. And where are the three that are? I mean, are you willing to share where these all are? Yeah, they're all in the book. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I talk about a lot of this. Uh, so we'll try to get back on track after I tell you this one point. But right, right. I'll let you get on track. 2024. Okay. Here's your other big opportunity. 2024 is a huge important year for anybody alive who and no one no one alive today will see this again um 13 times 17 is 221 it is every 221 years a 13 year brood and a 17 year brood co-emerge and that's 2024 it sounds so, apocalyptic. It is apocalyptic. Where so, but that doesn't necessarily mean like it's all in the same place, right? Because we talked about brood distribution. But could it so, be? Yeah, right where it occurs, yeah. they definitely overlap. So <gasps> when where that happens is around Illinois, Missouri, right somewhere in the Midwest there, and it's a pretty big distribution north to south, and then it goes very far east. Uh, the 17 year goes very far um, or 13 year goes very far east all the way to Virginia. So there's huge opportunities in 2024 to chase a 13 year or 17 year. And what's cool about it is the same bugs, They're the same bugs. So when you think of broods, they're, they contain multiple species. There's three major species of periodical cicadas. But when you think of broods, those and one of the doctors that I talked to about this, I like the way he describes it. They're class reunions. Okay. So, you know, you're the class of 2024 and <laughs> you're the class of 2025, but you're the same, you're, you know, humans, right. But they're the same cicada species. So um, scientists are really watching this because they don't have any data from the last 221 years to see if, and they can genetic test until this one's a 13 year of this species and this one's a 17 year of this species and where they co-emerge, see if there's an inner intermingling. And that another mystery that might unlock something else. So crazy stuff. Pretty awesome. Wow. This is very interesting. Okay, <laughs> it's, let it's me, crazy. <laughs> let me let you get back on track. Cause I'm assuming you're walking us through. Yeah. We, we stopped at larva. Stuff. Okay, so are we going through life cycle still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, so, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm going to stop talking so and I'm just going to listen. Mom and dad made babies. They had eggs. Eggs became larva. Larva fell out of the tree, went into the ground. Now they spend a whole bunch of time growing. And annuals do the same thing, although it might be a, 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 a shorter growth period, right? So just like our nymphs in the rivers, uh, nymphs have to, they have to shed their skin right? So they have to shed their skin to grow to the next size. Cicada nymphs do the same thing. So they're going to, those are the different, what they call instars scientifically, right? Uh, same thing with our aquatic bugs. So 
they basically suck around on on roots and grow and get big and then they get too big and they got to morph and they keep morphing, morphing, morphing four or five different times. And then they become like the biggest version of the nymph. And the biggest version of the nymph is going to be just about the same as the body size of the adult insect. Um, so when we're talking periodicals and this is where the fish and fun comes in, you're looking at a size four or size two. That's how big. So a body length of uh, 30 millimeters. And then you add wings on that 50 millimeters isn't, isn't out of the norm. It's a pretty enormous bug. And you've seen the ones you've seen in Australia as well. They even get bigger. All right. So these, uh, these bugs spend a whole lot of time underground growing, eating, and then they get this trigger that it's time to emerge. And that is based on their life cycle. So however long their life cycle is. So if it's a 13 year cicada, it's going to happen in 13 years. If it's an annual cicada, annual cicadas have a lot of mystery around them too. Um, it's not very well known that some of them may, it only to make take two years to reach a maturity or four years. And we'll, we'll touch on a little bit why in a, in a, in a minute. Um, but the, the, the adult, it's, they get the trigger to emerge. It's their emergence year. And then it becomes, well, what time of year? Well, it's almost just like our fly hatches on the river, right? So, um, you know, it's May. You're going to have PMDs. You know, end of May, you're going to have green drakes or wherever you are, whatever it is. It's that kind of thing. And those are triggered often by water temperature plus time of year. Here, it's soil temperature. I mentioned 64 to 68 degrees at a depth of about eight inches from the surface. So what that is, is spring happened, sun's hitting the ground, days are getting longer, things are warming up, the soil's now warm, and they, they start working their way up. And when they get that 64, 68 degree temp, they drill these holes and come up. And when you see a tree that had very successful mating and egg laying and egg survival you're going to look at the ground and be like somebody just like poked a thousand holes here in the dirt and it's very distinct they're, they're very sharp edged holes and what they do then is they crawl out and it's it's at night um and it helps if um it, they'll do it anytime but it helps if you had like a a like a nice light rain or a couple days of rain, soften the soil up and you'll go out there and see bugs crawl. If you go out at night, you'll see bugs crawling up trees. Uh, you go out in the morning, you'll see the first versions of those bugs. So if you've ever seen, again, like a stonefly emerge when it cracks out of its husk, it's like kind of looks funny. It needs to sit there and harden a bit and pump blood through all its wing veins and all that stuff. Cicada does the same thing. When they come out of their shell, they're like bone white, weird looking thing with big colored eyes. And then like uh, their wing veins are like black and it just looks like a science, science fiction movie. It's the craziest thing. And they sit there kind of all night and in the morning and all that while they're pumping blood through their bodies and they're drying out effectively. And they become the, you know, whatever their final color is going to be. Uh, periodicals are heavy on the orange and black, uh, usually black body with some orange striping, big red eyes, and the wing veins are orange, um, but lots of black, lots of orange. So orange deer hair, black foam, kind of all you need. Um, and then uh, annuals can be beautiful as well. They can be green and really vibrant blue and everything else, depending on the species and things like that. So the adults there hanging on a tree and what ha what happens is, is it actually now they don't all emerge in one night. So once that trigger starts, it's like, it really starts to build and you'll see this big wave. So one day, one morning you'll go out and I did this. So I mentioned 2019 where I live after work every day, I would drive to the reservoir where there's this park and I would just walk around trees and I'd be like, there's one. And with periodicals, when you find one, you're like, we're good. There's going to be billions. I can guarantee you this. There's going to be billions. Just give it time. 
So you see one and you're like, well, can't fish one. Um, and then go back every day. And I went every day for a week and I watched every day more and more and more and more and more. And then I would walk along the water's edge and I'd just look and be like, is there any bugs near these trees here? And then you're also listening. So you're scouting with your eyes, looking for signs, looking for signs of emergence. And then you're listening. It's like, nobody's talking yet. Nobody's, nobody's screaming. That temperature thing's really important, but also that time element that the numbers got to build. So they don't just crawl out and start mating and start finding a mate. You got to get to this critical mass. And that happens usually eight to 10 days after the first emergence. So come back in eight to 10 days and you're like, ah, I hear one. And you're like, all right, it's starting. So they, when the male starts singing is when the flying starts. So a cicada in a, in a tree up in the canopy, tucked on bark, whatever, is pretty safe. And it's really safe from a fish, right? Fish isn't going to get them there. They need to fly for our fish to find them. And when you hear singing is when you're gonna hear flying because that's, they're doing their job to attract a mate. And maybe there's a female over there in that tree. They hear it singing. They're like, I gotta fly over there. And, you know, get knocked down, a bird attacks them and knocks them into the water. Happens a couple million more times and fish start to notice. Think that's our life cycle. <laughs> Right. They are so incredible. The, in the book, do you dive into fishing specifically and how oh, yeah. this relates to fishing? Can we oh, talk yeah. a, a little bit about that? I know you don't want to give too much away, but I'm going to pick your brain for what I can get here. Yeah. So continuing on with that. So I can tell you that experience, experience with that, that uh, brood was scouting every day, going, going and seeing. I knew they were going to be there because I did the homework and, and I go every day and be like, oh, all right, there's more and more. And then it, literally one day I went. And I couldn't believe the amount of bugs. And I was like, okay, we hit the day where they're all coming out. So now I'm making phone calls and telling my friends like next, next week, Wednesday, you got to be here. Cause this is when it's going to happen. So fishing. So now you're, you're, you're listening when they sing, they're going to start flying. You need those warm days. You need warm days. They need warm days to sing. They need warm days to fly. So you get that day, you do your scouting and I remember that day I went to the water's edge and I saw a cicada on the surface and it's fluttering. And, if, and it, once the cicada is on the water, game over. No way they can get off. No way they can fly, like can't move themselves from the water. I mean, rare cases where maybe it's a river and they, you know, catch a log and they can crawl out, but it's game over. Something's going to get eat them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be anything is going to eat them once the ecosystem realizes what's there. Um, I remember standing there, seeing this bug, and then I saw movement in the left side, and I look over, and there's two carp cruising along, and they saw this bug, and they raced to it, and one ate it, and I was like, okay, we're fishing now, and I had a seven-weight rigged in the truck, and I ran and got it, and I waited. They came back around, threw out there, caught the first fish, uh, of that and then I was on the phone and I was I live real close so I was racing home boat was ready hitched it up grabbed my daughter we were out and caught a whole bunch that night so yeah so fishing them it, it's it's paying attention to those signs that you hear them you see them and you know they're flying and and it doesn't happen instantaneously so even on that first day where they're flying the fish don't know yet they just don't they they don't know it's there especially i mentioned carp and and i go into really big detail on carp and you'll 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 learn that when i think of cicadas i think of going carp fishing i'm seeing carp that on, i'm piecing that together while you're yeah speaking. yep carp on dry flies i mean it's the it's a crazy game and, I, and it's i mean who doesn't want to catch big fish by the hundreds and and i don't know it's a great thing it, it so you're looking for the signs you're you're listening you're watching you're scouting you're hearing them now um the fish don't know they're there until enough bugs hit the water now i think this is again mystery and theory i think some fish are programmed for it um when it comes to annual cicadas annual cicadas typically occur middle summer to fall 
in most places um around here i think there's some spring cicadas else like in the west and i think there's some spring cicadas where you're at but i think fish are programmed for the annual varieties like they know they're there they know like there's some nature connection that those are provided for some reason and some of that reason is fish going to eat them yeah and, uh, i was going to ask you why not just fish cicadas all year long oh well, i've tried yeah and you can yeah successfully yeah for bass definitely all summer okay. long for sure uh winter probably not um uh, but uh yeah definitely later than i expected for okay. sure and earlier yeah right yeah so i think they're i think fish are programmed for them now like you think of a trout a trout's program to like eat off the surface they they look and they're built for it I, I talk about their anatomy a lot in the book as well like they have a very good view straight up so anything that hits the water like a trout is there's food there i'm gonna go get it so when you have piles of cicadas hitting the water they'll they're gonna be aggressively eating them um i think i think on the annual cicadas definitely our smallmouth bass are programmed for it it's a time of the year where their regular sources like their bait fish are always there and there's you know big groups of them so they'll always chase those crayfish are in their in their biggest wariest state and then i think this big meal shows up on the surface and they they tend to be up to opportunistic for it and they know it's there and i know i'm gonna eat it so um yeah is it theories <laughs> i love theories is the periodical hatch perhaps overwhelming what happens to the fishing at that point it is can you be so, lost in the mass um yeah i think sometimes you can but it, it, there's so many opportunities there's so many shots it's like ah miss that one or he didn't see my bug like twitch it cast it again oh the other sees it uh yeah it can be it's overwhelmed you, you you use a great term there overwhelmed um part of the reason why like why the why there are so many bugs is they've evolved to that and that's another theory mystery predator satiation birds can't get them all animals can't get them all skunks can't get them all raccoons uh, turtles whatever they can't get them all so successful survival depends on big numbers that's yeah. an interesting one. I like that. Yeah. I mean, it makes yeah. it makes sense, doesn't it? Even though they're designed to be spent and be eaten after they've already done their job. Yeah, it's just like mayflies, right? There's yeah. a million mayflies in a spinner fall and cedar waxwings are eating them. They can't get them all. The numbers ensure survival of the species, right? What was the biggest revelation you had writing the book? Besides the fact that Stackpole got back to you in three days. That's amazing. Yeah, Um the biggest revelation with, with the, the writing of the book and I don't know, cicada stuff in general. Um, and I talk about the, the carp thing. Um, there's a few epiphanies with seeing, seeing for the first time. Well, yeah. Seeing for the first time a carp realize that that food is up there on the surface. Cause think of a carp, it, it's physiology it's eyes face down it's a down eating it's a bottom feeding fish that is designed for that very efficiently and when a carp it tilts its head up it's blind it cannot see what's above so there is a there's a few moments and and i and i talk about this in the book as well there was a moment where we we're fishing and a bluegill, right? Bluegill, super opportunistic, is over there. A group of bluegills is under this tree, and there's a big carp swimming around them. And there were cicadas. Bug falls in, periodical emergence. This happened. This was in Virginia. And uh, the bluegills jump, ran up and grabbed the bug. But the bluegill, tiny little mouth, big bug, couldn't do anything with it. And what happened was that carp completely bullied that bluegill and stole the cicada and we watched that over and over and we're like and that was very early in the in the fishable emergence and what we saw there was the light bulb of that go off on that fish and say holy cow i can get my own they're up there 
they're falling from the, the sky and I don't need to steal them from the bluegill anymore. And like the very next day, like a light switch, the carp knew those bugs are on top and they would hunt them. They'd swim at a depth just under the surface. Their lateral lines would tell them something hit the water and they would race over to it, tip up to it, but not be able to see it. So they'd be sitting there trying to eat off the surface, feeling around for something that they know is food and then finding it. And at the whole time, you're the, (laughs) this is the other thing I love. I want to see every person catch their first 20 carp on cicadas because it's, it's just a hilarious thing because you are doing everything you can to let that fish close its mouth and go down before you set the hook. Because it can't see your it can't. fly. Yeah. So yeah. wait, so are you trying to land your fly as loud as possible? In as cases, a dinner bell? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're knocking on the dinner table. You see them, it's like, it's, <clears throat> and you'll see, like I'm getting very animated about carp because nothing raises my heart rate like that. Um, I just, I love it. It, it You'll see them, we'll, what we'll typically do in lakes is park our boat and we'll watch the shoreline. And you'd be like, here comes three blimps. Here they come, just like bonefish, just like any of that saltwater predator stuff. We are fishing flats. It's the same same drug. It's awesome. Will they eat the cicada if it's dead, or does it need to be dying? No, same, same. it doesn't matter. Twitching wings, buzzing, dead still. They're eating everything. Something is eating every one of them. What did you yeah. notice about the behavior when it came to trout? Uh, trout, uh, pretty aggressive. Um, so fished a lot of trout. Um, if you want to fish trout, the, the disclaimer there is, is when it's periodical time, it's usually May, June and it's water temps. You got to watch. So while it's fun and they're going to be eating them, got to watch those water temps. Um, anything above 65 dangerous, right? So, and we're talking about hot days. So June can be 90 degrees, whatever. So cold water rivers, big rivers, bottom release, stuff like that is what we'd be targeting there. Um, but trout, no mistake, they're aggressive. Like, again, they're built for, there's bugs on the surface, eat them. And when it's, when they're tuned into cicadas, the trout get, trout get funny. I mean, they don't seem to have an off switch and they will eat till they're lumpy. And they're you literally will hold, and you can see some of the pictures in the book and things that you you look at that fish and you're holding it, and it's like there's like acorns in it. They're full, they're lumpy uh, with with bugs. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Is there ever a time yeah. when they're focused on? So- have you ever seen in your experience a time when they've been focused on something else, even though the cicada hatch is happening? Yeah, I mean, you can catch trout a million different ways. I think we give them a lot of credit. Like they're so smart and all this. And it's fish with the size of brain size of a pea or less or something you could catch them every way right i mean i so experiences um we're in the middle of a big emergence fishing trout on cicadas and nothing else and i and when it's cicada time there's only one box like i I carry nothing else a spool of 10 to 20 pound tippet and a box of bugs like that's it there's no reason to fish anything else um and running into running into guys on the river and like, how, like you know we're like just glowing with like it's been incredible like wow and not counting fish but you know you've caught a lot of fish right uh and you talk to them and like how many did you get and they're like oh two i'm like two that doesn't sound right on cicadas oh no we're fishing nymphs i was like huh I was like, you ought to try some of these, you know, and give them some bugs. And well, we're not seeing them. That's the other thing. So that's the other, the other thing with this. It's, it's a terrestrial. Remember that it's not coming out of the water. It's, it's coming by accident to the water, but there's so many around. And, and I think those fish are programmed. They know what it is. So you're not going to see, you're not going to, you're going to show up the river and, you know, going to wait for the hatch. No. No, 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 no. You just fish that thing blindly. Fish it like you're fishing a streamer. Mm-hmm. Just cast it, work water, let it dead drift, maybe twitch it a little bit and wait. I mean, those fish are going to eat it. So. Is there a commercially tied pattern that you recommend or that you favor? 
Um, you know, there's some really awesome commercially tied patterns for like the Green River that why, I think are great. Why specifically for one river? Uh, so the Green River is a unique one, right? So the Green River is, a, is just a crazy thing, right? So it was created uh, part of the uh, water pact uh, with the Colorado River and everything else. So completely manufactured, right? Uh, it was a desert trickle. And most of the water sits in Wyoming. And right there, uh, Dutch John is Flaming Gorge. Those are desert cicadas. They've always been there. They're just a desert variety of cicadas that that grew in those alders and pine trees and scrub brush that they have there but it just so happened we put a trout fishing river there <laughs> and, it, and it just it's a uh, it's a very dependable uh, annual thing there's two varieties of cicadas there there's one that's really small and very unique as well um, and then there's a very big one that you could actually fish the same pattern I fish for periodicals in the East, it's the same black and orange, same size. You could fish any of those. Um, but there are some really great patterns that have evolved there since, you know, almost immediately that became a, a trout fishing river. Like it was like they built the dam, it went live, they filled it up. And three years later, blue ribbon trout fishery, like it just was phenomenal. Uh, so since, you know, fishing really started there, um, the guides took notice of cicadas and there's like some pretty good names attached to some of those patterns like Charlie Card has a great you know great periodical or not periodical a great annual small cicada that they have there and those are you could find those uh, I think uh, Umpqua makes those uh, Brad Lovejoy is another green guide Lovejoy cicada I really like it's a, it's a great little pattern um, yeah Okay, so there's, this is there's a few of them out there, and I, I have 59 patterns in the book, and those are included. So, well, that's my next question. Can you tell yeah. me, just walk me through the table of contents, if you don't mind? Yeah, I got one right here. And Let's where see. can people buy the book? All the, all the, you know, plug bits. Yeah, um, you can buy it anywhere. So, Stackpole's a great publisher. Anywhere you buy books, you can find this book. So, Amazon's a great place to find it. BarnesandNoble.com. Um, you can buy it directly from Roman and Littlefield, the parent pub publisher. Um, yeah, it's it's do a quick search; it's everywhere. It's been uh, it's been doing well. It's been selling out in and out on Amazon every couple of days, so I think that's pretty great, uh, pretty cool. Uh, table of contents. Uh, so first, going through kind of a scientific overview of the bug itself. So a lot of the stuff we talked about here, April, um, and then a little, a lot about scouting. So chapter two is scouting. Uh, chapter three, we talk about fish behavior of all kinds of fish um, and how they react to cicadas and, and things. Um, chapter four is a little bit, I talk about some destinations. I talk about the green. I talk about a couple, um, rivers in Pennsylvania that it's not a spot burning book. It was never my goal. I picked places that were very well known already, um, and shared experiences about those rivers. And I feel those rivers can, can take the pressure. Uh, they're giant. They're hard to fish, <laughs> which is, is good. Um, and, uh, you know, they've, they, they've have some uh, proven experiences. And then chapter five, imitations, 59 different patterns. Um, we love patterns, right? Um, and then um, chapter six is, you know, how to fish those patterns and some additional tactics. So. Love it. And I'm obviously going to include the, link, the links to all of this. Um, yeah. I'll include the links to the book. But I'm going to also roll the audio and, like I said, if you're on YouTube, the visuals from your presentation. Are you okay with that? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, April. Yeah, and I can I I can send you that uh, presentation if you like, if you want. It's uh, it's going to be fun now reading your book. I do have a copy of your book. I'm excited to read it, yeah. um, especially because selfishly, see, I recently discovered a a little river here mm. in Australia that does have trout in it, yes. and it just so happens to be right where there's every time I go through this particular part of the forest in the summer, there's this crazy roar of cicadas. You hear them. And so I'm positive that yes. they, they must be in there. I, the fishing. Anyway, I, I don't want to say anything. 
I certainly don't want to give anything away, but I think selfishly uh-huh. there might be a little opportunity for me. Oh to yeah. Help with you. If you're hearing them like that, and there's a you said roar, like that's we have a lot to, of bugs. <laughs> Charles and I have to pull over. We pull over at the same spot every time because we always drive up through the spot during our kind of vacation up north, and yeah. we pull over, and it's just all it's deafening. There's a lot of bugs then. If it, if you say use the words roar and deafening, deafening, that's like our periodicals, and so get catch one find one send mm-hmm. me a picture let's identify this thing and figure it out and uh then you figure it out and then i'll come visit i'm really excited <laughs> right now so i will i will read the book but what i was uh-huh. saying is that in reading your book it's so yeah. nice now to be able to have your voice and be able to hear in my yeah. head you know your voice behind it are you gonna do an audio book you know so it's so funny some other people ask me that. i don't even know if that's an option i don't know i don't know that people would want to hear me talk You'd be amazed. I love, I love audiobooks and I love audiobooks that are read by the author. Yeah, that's cool. Yep. Yeah. Just a thought. Just a thought. All right. Well, I'll roll with that. Um, obviously there's other stuff that that we can discuss um sure. later. Is there anything that I've missed in particular that you'd like to add? No, uh no, not not at all. I, I really appreciate it, April. Uh this is uh, you know, I've listened to every one of your podcasts and uh, Aww. you know, I'm I'm a I'm really the last three or four years, you know, evolving in this fly fishing thing. Like I've, evo- it's funny. I like extremes. Like the cicada thing is like big, big bugs, huge numbers. And you're, you're going to catch a lot of fish, but I also love the unicorn hunt on the other end. And in the last three years, spay has been like my life. Uh, right. Like I love every aspect of it. And um, yeah, just all in on that. And, you know, maybe not catching a fish is good too. So uh, a lot of your resources and stuff get used by me. So uh, I, uh, I, I learn a lot uh, from what you've done on your career as well. So I, I really appreciate what you've done there. Oh, well, thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, can I ask you one last question? I don't know if I'll sure. include, include this in here, but so were you in the industry, quote unquote industry before writing the book? I'm a nobody. No, don't nope. say that. You're an author, Mm-mm. my friend. <laughs> I am now. Yeah. No, I was not. I, um, no, I, I never guided. Um, I've, I'll fish with anybody once. Um, and some of those people became lifelong friends. Um, industry, maybe a little bit, but on a different side of it. Um, my wood boat stuff has been what I've been involved in for a long time. Yeah. Uh, down home boat work. So I've, I've designed a several different kinds of drift boats and things and, um, really a big fan of the skiff type of drift boat. And I, I was doing that a long time ago and it's, it's pretty cool to see that like skiffs are pretty popular. So that aspect, but a lot of that was fishing and like river running. I, I love, you know, running all kinds of water and white water and things like that. So I wouldn't, it was kind of self done, like not, not through anybody else. Um, so no, I really way. wasn't in the fishing industry at all. <laughs> Just a busy guy with a lot of interests. <laughs> Dave, thank you so much for taking the time to come on to the show today. Thanks, April. It's great talking um, to you. Cicada Madness, here we are. Uh, so as a- April had, had mentioned, you know, I did author a book that is actually coming out here in this October. So, um, and there's some information at the end of this uh, around it, but we want to talk about cicadas. And uh, right now where I sit in... Southwestern Pennsylvania, um, it is our annual cicada madness. And uh, that is uh, a lot of really good surface fishing in our warm water rivers. And we'll, we'll talk a bunch about that as well. So cicada madness. Uh, so we're gonna go over a few things. Um, the general bug information, uh, life cycle, and there's two really big differentiators here, periodical and annuals. We're gonna talk about finding these bugs and finding where the good fishing is and how we do that. Uh, A whole lot about fly patterns, what works, what doesn't, what we look for. And then I'll talk through some slideshow shots of some pretty great fish or pretty great situations. Have some question and answer and uh, talk about uh, the book and ask all the questions you want. All right, so starting with the bug, this is the cicada. Um, So what you see here are not every kind of cicada, but this is what they look like. Terrestrial insect. So does not emerge from the water, emerges from the ground. So think grasshopper, think beetle, these types of bugs. 
what you see on the leftmost picture there is this was a 2016 in southwestern Pennsylvania emergence of periodical cicadas. Magis cicada is uh, is their their Latin name. Uh, big red eyes, only cicadas with big red eyes, black bodies, lots of orange and orange stripes on their bellies. We'll get we'll show you some of those as well. In the middle here are, are what we're fishing right now in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania and across the eastern United States, actually. Um, and, and even some of eastern Canada has some of this. Uh, these are the dog day cicadas. Dog day cicadas is, is largely a, a slang term for the annual variety of the, the eastern cicadas. And you can see big contrast, right? They're green, black, browns, golds. Uh, we'll talk about uh, a lot of this in fly pattern stuff as well. And then on the right, uh, these are really tiny cicadas. Um, these, are, these are actually from the Green River in Utah. These are a very unique cicada. And you can see more of that black and orange. And it's actually, they're about a, a charcoal color underneath and iridescent and some grays and shiny spots and dull spots as well. These are typical of desert cicadas. So in general, as you can see across very big differences of cicadas and color, but when you look at the shape and you look at the profile of that insect, it's about all the same. Three pairs of legs, big eyes, whatever the color they are. And then they actually have four wings. Uh, these two big outer wings and then there's two half wings underneath. In all the species that you look at, you can see that outer wing vein is the primary color you're going to want to imitate when we talk about fly pattern stuff again. The orange ones there on the, the periodicals, really heavy orange on the outer wing. And then these middle ones, these annuals, they're, they're bright green when they're brand new. And after a week or two, they get darker and darker and darker throughout their end of their life cycle. All right, so let's talk about that life cycle. Let's talk a, a little bit about these facts around this bug. So there's 3,000 species worldwide. Where, where April's sitting in Australia, there's a lot of cicadas there. Some are giant, some are tiny. New Zealand, you've probably heard fishing around cicadas there. I haven't experienced it yet, but uh, I plan to. Sorry about that clap. Um, they're true bugs. So the difference between a true bug and a false bug uh, and this is scientist stuff. True bugs, they actually have a beak that sucks xylem or sap from trees, tree roots uh, under the bark. So terrestrial insect, these are true bugs like uh, leaf hoppers, uh, most aphids, um, and our, our uh, stink bugs, if you've ever heard of those, are, are true bugs. Only the adult, adults in these have the ability to, to fly, just like our mayflies, right? Our mayflies are a waterborne insect, but the adults fly. We know all about nymphs. The adults is the, the adults phase is the last phase of their life. They about live about four to six weeks. And in that, you can have probably a month or more of really fantastic fishing. Really a uh, cool fact about them. Um, and... I won't show it here, but you can, if, if you find my Instagram, I've been posting all kinds of uh, stories about the bugs and the noise. Uh, only the males make noise. So they, they possess a specific piece of anatomy that allows them to make noise in a certain frequency that only attracts the female of the species. So if there's multiple species in an area, which there often is, the females will be attracted to the right one. It's very cool stuff. Uh, heat is your friend when it comes to cicadas. So they're most active during the day. Um, the males can only sing in temperatures of 70 degrees or above. So they need to warm up. So in the morning, you typically don't hear them. Afternoon, one o'clock, two o'clock, whole place is screaming. Bright sunlight is your friend with these things. So it's kind of opposite of like all the the fishing uh, stuff we talk about is like, oh, you need rain for a good blue wing olive hatch. You need cooler, you know, air than water temp and that bugs can't leave the surface. With cicadas, you want hot, 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 hot. It's pretty cool. Um, they are not locusts. And, and um, this is a, a common thing when you, you talk to folks and you say, oh, do you hear the cicadas? Oh, those are locusts. Oh, they're not locusts. Locusts is a completely different animal. 
And uh, lastly, you can eat them. And uh, at least uh, three of the people on here have eaten them. I know that for a fact, uh, myself included. So um, you can eat them. We, uh, we debate what they taste like, and you can ask that in Q&A, and I'll give you answers. Um, and they don't have the ability to bite back. They have this beak, but as adults, their beak is kind of useless. And it, it's not a stinger. They can't poke you. They're just big old creepy bugs. <laughs> All right, so annual or periodical. And I, I mentioned this in the beginning, and, and that the big orange species that you see there is, an, is a periodical cicada. Difference being, an annual, just like plants um, that you might buy at the, the, the hardware store for, for planting, you might buy perennials or annuals. Annuals occur every year. Um, magnitude of emerges varies, but you're going to find a quantity of bugs every year. Uh, you've heard of maybe uh, Mormon crickets or grasshopper plagues in the West, um, very similar to this. Uh, some years there's huge bumps of them and some that some years there's not and pretty hard to predict, but there are some kind of scientific studies going on that enables us to understand these a little bit better. Almost all of the spe species of cicadas globally are annual. Now it takes you to periodical. Periodical is a coordinated mass emergence. And the only place periodical cicadas exist are the eastern half of the United States, roughly divided by the Mississippi River. So it's very odd that periodical cicadas only exist in the United States and only east of the Mississippi. And there's lots of reasons why I go through a lot of that in the book. Scientists study it, uh, try to understand it. Um, but here's, here's, what, here's what we do know about them. Uh, if you look at the Eastern United States and the geography and the mountains and glacial movements, put a little bit of climate change in there. And these cicadas were buried under ice and then they weren't, and then they were, and then they weren't. And all of these kind of geological events may have pushed it to a periodical occurrence of emergence. What's interesting about it, they happen either 13 years or 17 years. Uh, there are 15 of these broods. They're divided up into names and we use Roman numerals to talk about these things. So in broods, these are class reunions, same species, right? Same species of bug, that big orange cicada, same species of bug, but its class graduated in uh, 2016, and the next class of the same species in a different area is 17 years later or 13 years later, depending on the brood that we're talking about. Just for an example of, of, of these broods, 2021 was brood X. And if you were kind of anywhere in the Eastern United States, it was all over the news. Typically when, when these things are going to happen, they're major things because no one's seen it for 17 years. So it's an automatic news story. Um, you're going to see all these recipes come out on how to eat them, how to cook them, or all these cautionary, don't let your dogs eat them. They'll get sick and everything else. Um, but they, they, they occur so infrequently, 17 or 13 years, um, that it's always such a major discussion and a major event. It's, it's pretty cool. So as fishermen, we are always looking at it and I'm always looking at the calendar. Look, got a map on that wall and I got a calendar and I'm looking like, okay, 2024, big event, 2025, huge event that, that a few of us have experienced in the past. Um, interesting stuff. 2021, Brood X was a huge Eastern, Eastern cicada um, emergence. 2022 and 2023, no periodicals. They don't, they're not every year, but these are predictable, predictable emergences of bugs. 2022 and 2023 are missing broods, what they call, um, that there was none recorded. There are stragglers or cicadas that may emerge a little bit early or a little bit late, but they're not considered a brood of enough of a mass emergence. So this year, no periodical cicadas. 
2024, um, everybody here and everybody alive today will never see this again. Uh, the 17 year brood 13 and the 13 year brood 19 co-emerge. And this is a pretty big scientific event. So all the bug nerds are gonna be all over this. They already are talking about it. Where's, where does this happen? Where's it going to be? And it's not the fact that they are going to mix or intermingle. It's just the fact that we have two broods going on at the same time that actually cover a landmass from Illinois all the way to Washington, DC. So if you just marked across the country through that, there are going to be cicadas as far south as Alabama, far north as Illinois and Ohio, straight across bottom of Pennsylvania, all the way to Washington, DC. So pretty crazy event um, and something that can be planned around. There will be bugs. So with periodical cicadas versus the annuals, if you, if you recall the annuals, they happen every year, but maybe there's a lot one year and maybe there's only a little bit the next year. With periodicals, make no mistake, there's going to be millions of bugs. So be there, find some water and where to fish. And we'll talk about that. But first, uh, let's talk about the anatomy of the cicada. So uh, as I said earlier, three pairs of legs, two pairs of wings. There's half wings and full wings. And then you can see the beak in the photo there. Um, both male and female possess it. This is what they used as juveniles to suck on tree roots to feed themselves. Um, how do I know these are female and male? They're pretty easy, distinct, different anatomy, right? So the ovipositor on the female, typically their bodies come to this pronounced point. Right now on this photograph, the ovipositor is, is retracted. So it, there's actually a piece that extends and it actually is used to poke into tree bark and deposit the eggs. And I'll show you some photos of that in the next couple slides. The males are pretty easy to identify. They have these, these timbal covers. So if you look at those gold tannish pads just below the last pair of legs, those are uh, the anatomy that is used to make the sound, the call of the cicada. So those little covers actually kind of flap open and it shakes their body, they shake their body and they pump air in and out and it makes that rattling sound of the cicada. So when you grab one, you pick it up, you look at it, you flip it over, no timbles, probably a female uh, or most definitely a female. Um, so that's the difference between them. Now, do, does either one fish better than the other? No, not at all. No, fish don't know. Fish don't care. Um, but one thing I will tell you is when you hear cicadas, you're only hearing the males. So if you look at that tree or you're, you're near a tree and that tree is just screaming with bugs, there's probably twice as many bugs there because those males will congregate there, call the females to them. The females don't make noise. So when you're hearing males, there's a good chance that there's probably twice amount of bugs than you hear. It's pretty cool stuff. All right, so life cycle. The life cycle is, uh, is uh, pretty unique and pretty interesting, uh, partly because of their anatomy and partly because of the length of the life cycle here. So the first thing that happens is mating, right? You can see that there. Um, females, um, no matter what species you are, they have roughly five, 600 700 eggs. Um, they typically mate and go right off to deposit their eggs. Uh, scientists tell me that sometimes a female will get mated a couple times, but it doesn't seem to really matter that they will usually mate and then go fly away and find a suitable tree. And a suitable tree for any cicada is a big mature tree. So we talk about a little bit of conservation stuff. How do you want to save cicadas? They need some mature trees. Um, they usually use mature trees to deposit their eggs and grow their young and carry on the next generations. Um, there, are, there are extinct broods of cicadas that we know about, one particular up around Long Island. 
that used to exist and started to wane in the 1950s and is now declared extinct. And it's really because of urbanization. So golf courses, paved uh, parking lots, urban sprawl, expansion, uh, you know, if a periodical cicada mom lays an egg, develops into a larva, and it needs 17 years to come out, and it tries to come up through a paved parking lot, <laughs> we've got a problem. It's not gonna. All right, so after mating, um, this is uh, this bottom photo here using the ovipositor. You can see the marks in the bark here. She actually works backwards and she will, she will attract her ovipositor and slice into that tree and drop about 10 to 20 eggs at a time and then keep moving on until all of those eggs are deposited. Once those eggs are, are in there, and the reason why she does that is this whole bug's food is tree sap. So it's typically in young growth of the tree so growth of that year, um, terminal branches with leaves, very soft, supple, thin bark. Um, she's not going to dig into the main old trunk of the tree. She can't. Uh, and there's not enough sap on the surface there. So young branches deposit the eggs uh, until they're done. And then her life is kind of over. She doesn't die right away, but now it's, um, it's really waiting, waiting to die at that point. Her life is uh has served its purpose just like our mayflies and caddisflies within five to seven days these eggs develop into small little larvae and um, they'll be milling around in in that tree sap in the in the bark and then they fall to the ground and they'll fall from 20 30 feet up from a tree doesn't doesn't seem to hurt them all uh there's so many that enough of them survive Often what you'll see in this bottom picture, the, this is called flagging. Uh, a few days after the, the female cicada deposits her eggs, she actually damaged that tree branch. She's not going to kill the whole tree, um, and cicadas won't kill this whole tree. But this is an evidence of quite a bit of mating and quite a bit of egg laying here. So when you see this flagging, two things. Um, about a week after egg laying, you'll start to see this. So you know there's been tons of cicada activity in that area. And then a lot of times those branches will actually fall. They'll break off and fall from wind or rain or whatever. And that'll carry even more larvae down to the ground where that larva will just crawl into the earth. So we look for flagging uh, when we're fishing and we're scouting in the middle of the emergence. You can see it from a mile away. It's typically big mature deciduous trees. Um, these are oak trees here. You'll see it in all kinds of trees. They don't seem to have a preference. And all cicadas will use the trees no matter where they are globally. Uh, they'll use the trees they have available to them. So they don't seem to have a preference, but uh, what, my, what we're talking about on the periodicals is the Eastern US, a lot of deciduous forests. So you'll see big mature oaks, walnuts, maples, hardwoods, cherries, everything, and everything will take, um, will take the same flagging look uh, midsummer after a cicada emergence. It's pretty cool stuff and it's good for the notes for, you know, 17 years down the road. So after those larvae drop into the ground, they start to grow and they're going to, they're, they're what we'll call a nymph, right? And every cicada, they will stick near that tree trunk. And most of that cicada's life is, if you can imagine a cubic yard or a cubic meter, they don't really venture beyond that. That's their whole world. They hang around tree roots. Um, they continue to feed. They'll poke their beak into the, into the root, suck some sap. And as they get bigger, uh, uh, just like most insects with an exoskeleton, they need to molt. So they'll shed, shed one skin and grow another one. This happens four, five, six times throughout the immature life of the cicada. When it's time to emerge, what you'll see is the exit hole. And this will look like a perfect three-eighths of an inch or uh, 15 millimeter hole in the earth and you'll see lots of them and they'll be around the bases of trees. It doesn't matter 
how hard the soil is or soft the soil is, they'll find their way up. So you want to look for this kind of thing before the, before the emergence is predicted. Uh, you, you'll see lots of these holes and you'll even see in the top right photo there, the nymphal shuck. These will be left clinging to trees for days. And if you're scouting and you're, you want to know, is there cicadas near this river and near this lake? Uh, what we've typically done is gone around the time of year when we're expecting it, which would be for us May, June. Uh, typically late May, we'll go around, we'll be looking at trees, walking around, looking at, the, looking at the ground, people wondering what those guys are doing. We're looking for signs of impending emergence. And if you find one periodical cicada, I can guarantee you there's going to be millions there. That's just how it is. Um, so after you see these holes, they crawl up a tree and they'll crawl up three feet, a meter. They'll crawl into the canopy on, in, some, in some cases. They'll do it at night so that they can avoid privation, predation because they're very vulnerable at that time. And that's what most of all species of cicadas will do. Emerge at night, crawl up a vertical surface, whether that's a tree, a telephone pole, whatever is nearby, they'll find it. They crawl up and they begin to emerge. And if you've ever seen a, a salmon fly or a golden stone fly emerge, crawl up on a rock and it'll crack in the middle of its uh, case and it'll start to unfold itself and roll the wings out. That's exactly what happens with these. But this is a land insect. This is a terrestrial insect. So they'll do the same thing, and then it'll look kind of uh, kind of alien. That uh, photo right there is a periodical. Red eyes right out of the gate, uh, but they're like, they have a glow to them at night. And, and until they fully harden and, you know, shake off their uh, wings and fill their wing veins with, with their blood, uh, they then, re then they start to get their darker color. But when they first emerge, they're, they glow in the dark almost. It's crazy. And then what you'll see at the peak of emergence is you're going to see everything. You're going to see hundreds of the cases stuck to trees, some trees, thousands. You're going to see thousands of holes in the ground. And then you're going to see days later, all those little shucks are going to fall. And the, the tr tree base is just littered with them. And you'll find millions in an area where, where you have significant em emergence. In the West, uh, we were at the, we were on the green last year in the middle of uh, annual cicadas, which is, which is pretty cool there. If you, if you know the Green River, the Green River is a kind of a manufactured fishery, right? It's a Flaming Gorge Dam, big lake, um, it's a desert. Right, there wasn't wasn't trout there uh, in the '60s until the dam came there, but these cicadas were there. These desert cicadas were there. Uh, we walked around on the banks, found the holes, found shucks, uh, found bugs in trees, found their casings. Um, it's all the same. Uh, you just look at the streamside vegetation, um, look near the water, and it, what's interesting about it, if you're on a river, one side of the river may have them the other side of the river will have few or both sides of the river have tons, but you, you have to do some scouting and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. All right. So finding the emergencies. Now, you know, the life cycle, basically um, what to look for. Uh, again, you have to know the cicadas that are in your area. And in my book, I talk a lot about some really generalized species that occur in big regions they're there. There's other ones there as well, but you need to know what to what what species you're looking for, and when they emerge. Um, in I mentioned the Green River in Utah. That is a May peaks in the beginning of June, but will carry through July. So you're not going to see anything if you go there in March. You're not going to see anything until you go there in April. But by middle of May, there's going to be a few emergences. You're going to see a couple holes. You're going to find a bug. Somebody's going to hear one, and you need to know what you're looking for. So that scouting piece is so important. So you got to know your, your bug you're looking for. Um, 
for the for where I'm at right now, and I, I mentioned I'm in southwest Pennsylvania, we don't have the periodical cicadas this year or right now, but we do have the annual cicadas. And it's uh, uh, the term is the dog days of summer. These are the dog day cicadas we, we call. And right now we're in our peak. Um, sometime in August, bugs, you start hearing them, you start seeing them. And I've been fishing almost every other day <laughs> because it's really good right now. Um, so the, you have to know what you're hearing and, and what to look for. So in a general sense, uh, periodicals uh, across, the, uh, across the, United, the Eastern United States are gonna be May, June. The further south you go, it's going to trigger it earlier. Why earlier? Interesting stuff about the emergence for cicadas is the ground temperature needs to reach 68 degrees at a depth of eight inches. And until it does, there's going to be no bugs. Once it reaches that, bugs start popping up. So that means summer solstice. That means longer days of daylight. Uh, all those kinds of things. So paying attention to those signs and knowing the bugs that are in your area. Scouting, looking for shucks, looking for holes in the ground. Um, and then middle of emergence, you're going to look for flagging. Um, what The mating doesn't occur as soon as they, they come out of the ground. The singing doesn't even occur as soon as they, they emerge. It takes about a week to 10 days to get the numbers up. And now there's significant enough numbers to have a mating and the males will start calling, start mating some, and then it's going to really build up and you're going to have lots of bugs, lots of noise. And then it's going to start to taper off, taper off, taper off. And you're going to see that flagging in trees. So in fishing, if you're, you're in, you're just being aware of the environment, right? Why is that tree have a whole bunch of dead leaves on it? It's like, should probably go take a look at that. Go go poke around. Are there holes? Are there shucks? Maybe even see some mature bugs. Um, we done that a lot. Driving along a river for a long way. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Hey, flagging, heavy flagging down a whole bank. Now we're racing to a boat ramp, trying to trying to find a place to slide a raft in. All right. So uh, listen, look, um, know what you're looking for. Uh, funny, funny story on our last emergence, did some pre-scouting, um, and I, I went to this, this big lake that we thought was going to have bugs, and we weren't sure if it was. It was on the line of some of the published maps, and these maps are in my book as well, and you know, I went and took a drive, and was like, if, if this lake has them, oh man, we are going to have a month of amazing fishing, you wouldn't believe, and I went or late May, driving around, looking around, and I'm, I'm poking around parking lots, looking at big mature trees, looking under leaves, looking for something. And a park game warden came up to me. He's like, what are you doing? You, you looking for something? And, and I was like, actually, I am. And, and uh, she was like, uh, you're looking for cicadas, aren't you? And I was like, yeah, I, I actually am. And she's like, go north. The north end of the lake they're everywhere. And I was like, sweet. Drove 20 miles to the north end of the lake and sure enough, cicadas. And then calling all the guys on the phone, like, we're good. <laughs> Get the boat hitched up. We're ready. Be ready in a week. Uh, so that's what you got to do. Yeah. You go, you go hunting for the bugs near the water. Um, and then you go find the fishing. That point three, be mobile. Uh, you know, we've noticed it on rivers you will be floating a 10 mile float on a river and at the boat ramp, they're screaming and bugs everywhere. Good fishing for a mile, nothing. What happened? Come around a bend, you hear them again. So they will be patchy at times when you see them. Um, this is true everywhere. This is true anywhere you're gonna have fishing. Upstream, split up, go looking for them if that's what you're gonna do is, is, is hunt for cicadas and you know just cover some water and find them or get lucky and you just happen into them, but pay attention to the signs. Uh, check often. Uh, one day bugs are non-existent and overnight they will occur. This was a story in 2019 
I went every day after work to the local lake. No one bugs should be here. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And then that one day I roll up and it was that night before billions of bugs, every mature tree had bugs falling off of it. And, uh, got to So, so if you went two days earlier, you would have said, ah, there's none here. Not going to be here. Go back, keep checking. If, if you've done your homework and, and scouted enough, you will find them and then be patient. So now once you find them, it doesn't necessarily mean that your fishing is going to be off the hook right away. Remember about the life cycle and remember about temperature. A bunch of bugs need to emerge. And until there's mating, they really have no reason to fly. Okay. So the males will start singing. Females will start flying. Males will start flying because they'll get impatient. They'll be like, no females are showing up. I got to go somewhere else. So now they fly over the river. And it's windy and they get knocked down. And then a hundred more get knocked down and a thousand more get knocked down. And now those fish know they have a food source that they can look up to. So if you see one bug on a tree, be patient, give it a week, give it 10 days, because until you're hearing the, the sounds and the flying and the mating is occurring, Fish don't know they're there. Fish are in the water. These are land bugs. They don't know what's happening. Um, if cicada hits the water, it can't recover itself. So it is dead unless, you know, it gets swept into vegetation or log jam or something that it can crawl out. But they cannot get themselves off the water under their own power. So they are just sitting ducks, a two inch long bug waiting to be eaten by somebody. And uh, the fish learn fast. Uh, we'll talk about those fish uh, pretty soon here. But at first, a point about water temps. All this stuff is occurring in summer. So trout waters get too warm. Um, it could be a bittersweet thing, right? Leave them alone. Don't fish 70 degree water just because cicadas are there. You're going to kill a lot of fish. Try and stay away. Pennsylvania, where I'm at, tailwaters in the west, good stuff. We've got cold water. Pennsylvania's got some limestone spring creeks that stay cold all summer long. Um, all our western tailwaters, um, there are the green, there's Montana rivers that have cicadas, Colorado rivers that have cicadas, Arizona rivers that have cicadas, fish tailwaters. Give trout a break, go fish warm water. You will have maybe more fun fishing more water uh warm water during a cicada emergence you'll you'll see some you'll see some photos as to why but we'll talk about fly patterns so now that you know the cicada you know the life cycle uh you know a little bit what to look for in the scouting thing and in in my book i talk a lot about scouting probably 50 percent of the book is scouting um bob bell who's on the call here big contributor to that. He and I have been at this for 30 years, chasing these bugs around. Um, the scouting piece is what you need. There's tools out there. The internet's great for it and bad for it. Um, there are apps. There's all kinds of stuff that helps you enable the scouting. We'll talk about fly patterns. All right, fly patterns. You see an army of cicadas here with their big orange eyes and rubber legs and everything. It really, this is all you need. But you, I know how it is. You're preparing for a trip. Uh, you just tie flies and different patterns and different styles and things like that. And uh, uh, there's lots of variety. So what you can see here just around um, the photo, we'll first spot the real ones, right? So there's a, a real one uh, upside down and, a, and one right side up. These are let's call them annual cicadas, dog day cicadas, summer uh, cicadas uh, that typically happen across the U.S., across the world. Uh, these are the ones that are happening some years in great numbers, some years in lower numbers. These are kind of the green ones and brown ones. Um, you can use commercially tied flies. The boogle bug that you see in the um, top left and bottom right, those are purchased flies. They even say boogle bug on them. They're just bass flies. Uh, those will copy 
an adult cicada pretty well. The big blockhead foam green and black popper, same thing. Uh, they'll copy a cicada really well, but then you can get really specific. Um, in the middle with the orange dot on its back, that's Blaine Chocolate Cicada um, that he gave me. Super realistic. It looks just like the real thing. Uh, painted these funky wings and everything. Um, Brandon Bale's flies are in the middle. Uh, one's a deer hair bug and one on the left is a foam bug. Um, they're very realistic with the big eyes and everything else. But what you should notice here is profiles, right? Um, if you look at the, the real cicadas that are on this page, um, their wings are nice and folded back. So patterns that are kind of slender with their wings back, like the cicada on the far left or the, the Brandon Bales one with the green eyes, wings are back. Blaine's cicada, wings are back. Uh, if you look at the deer hair bug on the bottom, the wings are splayed out. That's another, another fishy pattern that you can use. Uh, sometimes cicadas will flutter. Sometimes they sit dead silent on the surface. But sometimes they sit and flutter and they open up their wings and they get tired and they just lay them out. And now you have this big profile with wings splayed out. So those, the middle fly, the bottom fly, um, even the rubber legs on some of the flies can look like wings that are, that are laid out. Um, so lots of different patterns. And, and I'll say right now, my fishing is very, very good. Um, you could use any one of these patterns, but you have to fish it right. I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so that upper right, upper right corner, you can see Blaine's cicada there next to a real one. It's pretty darn close. It looks pretty good. And then uh, that bottom picture is a, is a recent smallmouth bass on a, on a, on a cicada. And uh, if you notice the size of the tippet we're fishing there, that makes this all fun. Dry fly fishing with 20 pound or 15 pound mono um, is pretty good using a seven weight or an eight weight. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Some uh, other detailed cicada patterns. Here's another one here um, with the wings splayed out, right? When, when you wanna fish that kind of pattern. I don't know. I don't know if one fish is better than the other, um, but fly fishers are who we are. We love flies. So you gotta have them all, you gotta have all kinds. Uh, the big cicada, the, the real cicada that you see here is a Utah cicada. This is a, this is a cicada that is common to the, um, let's see here, the, maybe the, the West from Utah, Arizona, California, Nevada. This is another desert cicada. This is um, a giant bug. And the bug that, the two bugs that are to the right of it are actually some guide patterns from the Green River. Um, these are super durable, super realistic. And on that fishery, it does matter. Uh, towards the middle of emergence, there's 50 to 60, 70 boats a day on that river. Those fish are seeing tons of bugs. So fishing realistic, fishing ones that look like the real thing um, may mean the difference between success and not success. How I get by that? Um, I don't typically fish a lot of the really realistic ones, uh, fish the harder water, fish the faster stuff, fish the stuff that no one's cast into. Um, and you're going to get fish that have seen less and you're probably going to catch more. And sometimes they're bigger ones as well. Um, so there you go. Lots of orange, right? So lots of orange and, uh, orange and black, orange and gray. Back to some green ones. Again, these are these are annual ones. Um, again, you've seen some of these already, but just a closer look at some of them. Uh, the real bug in the middle, uh, the Blaine chocolate bug on the bottom, Brandon Bale's deer hair bug on top. Um, and then a couple of my favorites that I use. Uh, these are typical bass bugs, blockhead popper made from a flip-flop. All right, so, and I didn't think I talked uh, too long. So, uh, I think what I was saying there was 
if you take that bottom right bug, the popper, and you put it on somebody's rod and you tell them fish that, what's their instinct? Their instinct is going to be cast it and pop it and pop it and pop it like a bass bug. And I'll tell you, cicada fishing resists the urge. Fish a dead drift. I know it's a popper. Doesn't mean you have to pop it. If you feel once in a while you want to swim it, just pull your line a little bit, swim it a little bit. And uh, what will often happen is when bug, when fish are looking for cicadas, they're not explosive eats because think about what I said earlier, the cicada that falls in the water is certain for death. It, it can't get away. It's not going anywhere. So a fish sees it and is like, that's a good meal casually goes up and doesn't really expend as much energy as it needs to, to eat it. So they're not going to chase a bug when they're looking for cicadas in my, my experience. Um, so popping a, a bass popper, sure. You're going to catch fish, but I guarantee you're going to catch a lot of smaller fish. If you want a big one, dead drift and resist the urge, just let it go. Uh, if you take say a smallmouth bass and any bass, right? a warm water fish now, their lateral line sensitivity is super high. So if that bug, which hits the water with some authority, every one of these patterns will because it's a big bug. It's two inches long almost. When it hits the water, every fish 20 feet around knows it's there. And fish is going to casually swim over and be like, hmm, I wonder if that's what I think it was. And sip it. And then until you set the hook, then it blows up. So don't typically expect big blow ups when fish are hunting these bugs. They're going to eat them because they know they got them. They know they got them. That's it's pretty, it's pretty fun stuff and kind of almost counterintuitive when you are fishing a big bug, you think, Oh, I got to swim it. I got to strip it. You don't have to. All right. So some, some more, uh, more patterns here. And, and I'm hope I'm giving you like kind of a general overview of these, these patterns and like, the sky's the limit, but we could take a quiz after this if we had to and say, like, what do you do for a cicada pattern? You can kind of probably come up with it. Lots of black, <laughs> orange or green to match the natural and some wings and legs. Um, pretty simple. Uh, this is the uh, this is the Platypedia cicada from Utah. Um, and it's in Utah. It's in Colorado, Montana, uh, everywhere. It's a small cicada. Um, it's, um, it's primarily like a grayish charcoal color with very muted orange. So not like a really glowing bright orange, but a muted orange. And that's why you'll see some browns or some like off colored wings and, and materials used in the patterns here. Uh, really co common mountain cicada, um, but smaller. So similar patterns, right? Low riding patterns on a good stout hook. Um, uh, legs and wings, right? Black with uh, legs and wings. That's kind of what you need. So in the summary, fly patterns, lots of black foam, orange, green, and gray highlights, match your local bugs. Um, the internet's a great resource. Um, my book's a good resource um, for the, the common ones to look for. And, and just a word like on that is the cicada shape is probably the most important. Um, some of the local color, color, you can't go wrong with brown, can't go wrong with green, can't go wrong with some orange. Um, I mean, impressionistic patterns are really good. Uh, we fish chubby Chernobyls too, right? And we fish them in pink um, and purple and everything else and fish eat the, the heck out of them. So uh, the cicada pattern doesn't need to be very uh, specific in most cases. High pressured fishery, you might want to go a little bit more realistic. Um, use stout hooks. Uh, I love the Gamakatsu B10S for most hooks. Big gate, fine wire, tiny little barb you can pinch. Um, and it doesn't seem to bend even on 30 pound fish. Uh, TMCO 3761 is actually a nymph hook that is really good. Um, that hook's used on uh, Andrew Grillo's hippie stomper fly in, in bigger sizes, which is a great fly. Uh, tie that fly in black and orange, and it's a great cicada as well. And then some modern hooks, the, the Hanak Streamer, BL, uh, Firehole Sticks make some similar hooks. Um, 
fine wire I like, but strong is really good. Size your patterns to your naturals. Um, most cicadas are going to be an inch in body to an inch in three eighths. So I don't know what that's in millimeters, 25 millimeters to 32 millimeters or so. Give that profile of a cicada, they're fat, stout bugs, right? So not skinny hoppers. They have wide bodies, as you can see. Um, I like patterns I can see far away. Uh, fish in these flies, fish long, fish far from the boat or far away from any water disturbance you're making that fish know your presence because sometimes they're looking in shallow water. Um, I like to see flies a far away. So some kind of indicator spot, um, even two indicator spots um, to, to combat glare or whatever side of the river you might be working on. Something like by visible even works pretty good. A black or a white or black and white indicator works pretty well. Uh, I like to have a lot of flies and I like fresh flies. So I tie a ton, so they gotta be easy to tie. So I tie a, tie a bunch and use glue. Um, so I use tons of super glue and like durable and, uh, I like tying fresh flies on. So they gotta be kind of easy to tie. So some, uh, super, uh, super realistic patterns. Maybe that's like a one or two in my box for every 10 or 20, uh, cicadas that we, uh, that we fish. And I'll tell you when, it, when, when it's cicada time for us, I take nothing else. I, that much confidence in fishing these bugs that. I will take a Tupperware container to hold my cicada flies and no fly boxes and a couple spools of tippet, uh, 10 or 10 to 20 pound. And we're going fishing and that's what we're fishing. And, uh, it's, uh, so when it's on, it, it can be really fantastic. All right. So oh, talk through some of these fish and, and photos and things like that. So, uh, Utah, uh, uh brown trout here. So, Small cicada, it's probably an 18 inch brown. Um, what a time. If you ever, if you ever get the opportunity to go or want to go somewhere where there's pretty reliable cicada fishing in June, um, they talk about it, they build their year around it. Uh, so book a guide. Uh, one of the most beautiful places in the world, uh, I think that you'll see that you'll ever catch a fish in. And uh, they will eat cicadas all day. And it's really cool. Take nothing else, tie nothing else on and, and fish dry, big dry flies. It's fun stuff. Uh, let's see here. Uh, pretty good smallmouth bass. Um, I'm a believer in a few things. And we talk about smallmouth bass a lot in, in the book that you can catch a lot of small bass pretty easily, in my opinion. Uh, fishing bass bugs and poppers and whatever, you'll catch a lot of 12, 14 inch, 15 inch bass, which is a great bass. But to catch a bass that I would consider big, 18 inches or better on a, on a dry fly, you got to do a couple things differently. And the first is you got to cast far um, and you've got to be very stealthy with your presentation. I think a lot on smallmouth bass that, uh, and we've, I mean, I've been testing this all week still, uh, fishing, fishing all week and all weekend and had a banner day the other day and caught a lot of big fish. But we also saw a lot of big fish. Now you get too close to them. I don't think they run away or spook. I just think they go to the bottom and they sit and that's where we see them. And if you want to get to a big bass, that lateral line is super important that they have that alerts of them every movement that's going on in their environment. You watch your drift boat go down the river and you make an oar stroke and you watch your ripple. You watch your ripple go down and it goes pretty far down. And that fish knows that a boat's coming. And I believe a lot of time, and we've, some of the guys on this call have pondered it a lot, like, they know you're there and they're just not going to eat. They're not going to spook, but they're just not going to eat. And then if you're bombing 60 foot casts into the shadows and into the shallow water or fishy looking spots, get this little sip and you set the hook and it blows up and that's what's on the end. That's kind of validating that big bass don't get big for being dumb, but you'll catch 14 inches all day by stripping your popper. I guarantee it. 
And you'll have a fun day and a good day, but big bass are a different story. All right, so I, I mentioned the hippie stomper. This is a this is a hippie stomper fly with a in a cicada outfit, right? Uh, and that's a, just a western mountain mountain stream, and uh, that was what's in the trees. So uh, these are cicadas uh, that happen to be there when when we were fishing there, and uh, happen to have some cicada patterns and some smaller ones. Um, and the fish were definitely looking for them and eating them. It's cool stuff. Uh, this, this is why I made that comment about carp, right? Oh, I took that away on you. Um, fish the warm water. You might have a lot of fun. Uh, love trout more than anybody. I love bass, but when it comes to cicada fishing, <laughs> uh, find me a lake with cicadas and every lake has carp in it. And if there's one indicator that the fishing is on it's when carp are looking up for it because a carp is a bottom feeder it's it's eyes face downward they don't really see when they see well when they look up if a bottom feeder is now on the surface hunting cruising a shoreline hanging around under trees and waiting for these bugs uh, it is explosive fishing and i will i will make no no lies about this. If you find a lake with cicadas and carp and you spend a week there, you're going to tangle with 300 to 500 fish. The, there are days where you're too tired and you're just like, I don't want to do it anymore. And then you tell yourself it's 17 years till the next one. Uh, you better get back out there and go do it. So um, this is actually a grass carp on the left. And these are from the same lake, and this was uh, 2019. This is a grass carp who shouldn't be there. Um, grass carp are, are, are stocked in the state of Pennsylvania only by permit in contained ponds. So somehow this one escaped into this big reservoir that we were fishing. And this kid's the only kid I know who will find the grass carp that shouldn't be there on two occasions. So um, that's a 44-inch 25 30 pound grass carp that ate a surface fly and um there's there i am with a you know almost 20 pound common carp um and you know th those are just two fish of 50 or 60 that day just incredible fishing and what it is 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 hunting so you're you're cruising a shoreline and these fish are almost sometimes with their fins out of the water and they're usually not alone. There's usually three, four, sometimes 10 and they're cruising. You know, they're looking for something. And when you throw a fly to them, their, their eyes face downward. So they don't see when they look their head up, when you throw a fly to them, they, they hear it hit, they know it hit and they run over and then they look up and they can't see it. So what they'll commonly do is they'll go below your fly and they'll see it and they'll be like, ah, oh, there it is. And they back back up and they open their mouth and they start going like this on the surface and then they feel it and grab it. And you're doing everything you can to let them go down with it before you set the hook. And uh, you will blow the first 10 or 20 that eat. And when they blow up, they blow up. It's, it's just incredible. And then when you hook one, they're a darn near perfect game fish. <laughs> and I get excited talking about carp. It, it is, it is just phenomenal to catch a boatload of big old stinky carp that if you haven't done it and you, you're, you're, it's dry fly fishing to the millionth power, uh, two inch bug, 20 pound tippet on an eight weight to a potentially 30 pound fish that's rising to, to a bug. And it's midsummer, it's 90 degrees, and there's bugs screaming on the hillsides. And you get to get up in the morning and go and do that again. It it's, lasts for a month. It's incredible. There's another, another carp. Sorry, I give you all the carp, carp photos. It looks like a pretty carp. <clears throat> and then there's some, some cicadas, you know, during a scouting mission on a, on a, on a little uh, uh, tree. So more, more black and orange, more, more carp again, right? Uh, shiny big carp. Uh, trout, as long as your arm will eat cicadas. 
And uh, that's, that's always good when they do. Um, some of the biggest trout uh, I think I've ever caught have been during cicada emergences, uh, 25, 27 inches, middle of the day, not night fishing, uh, anything like that. Watching water temps, going when there's bugs, going when it's safe to go and, and good for the fish and, and uh, using, a, using a sharp barbless hook uh, and uh, catching quite a few trout. Uh, I, I, again, smallmouth bass, this is a, also a, a recent one. Um, again, on a, on an annual cicada that we have going on right now. Um, and here's an oddball. This happened last week. So I had this presentation all made weeks ago and I like, I had to go back in. This was my friend, John. We went on an evening float after work, fishing cicadas, catching lots of nice bass. And he just released a 17 inch bass. And he says, all right, your turn. I was rowing and I, I'm, I'm standing up like, okay, it's my turn. He just released a great fish. We're going to get some more. And uh, he takes the, the rod and he casts it out to the middle of the river. And he's reeling it in. And he's reeling it in for me. And I'm like, don't reel it in. Just leave it there. He sets the rod down and he stands up and it blows up. And he grabs a rod and this fish is on. And we didn't know what it was. He's like, this has to be the biggest smallie. And I'm like, mm, maybe it's a carp. And then I'm like, it's not fighting like a carp. Maybe it's a muskie. And sure enough, gets it up and it's a 30 inch walleye. 30 inch walleye in a cicada. Now, can I guarantee you're going to catch that every time? No, but that just shows you like, I, I know fish know that that food source exists. It's late August, September. Uh, they're getting their fall feed on, I think nature provides and i believe they know to look for things like cicadas this was uh yesterday <laughs> uh another another decent bass on cicadas we're right in the middle of it here in pennsylvania um and this is a wooden this is a wood fly and i don't i don't have any other yeah a wood fly this is a fly i make just uh emulating a, a chuck craft bug if you know who chuck craft was he was a virginia uh, guide legend uh, came up with the Creelex. Um, that was his fly. The Chuck Craft Excalibur is this fly, and it's a cork or a wooden body fly painted, um, and it it imitates a really good cicada. And it it sits low in the water, which is really nice for big bass that are sipping. They'll just come up and take it barely in the sur in the surface film. And then I think lastly is a uh, another big. I think central PA brown. I mean, you can look, that fly is about a two inch long fly. So you can kind of see how big that fish, fish's mouth is. Um, but that's, you know, another middle of the day. You don't catch that fish typically around here, uh, you know, nymphing or, or fishing uh, mayfly hatches. So, so fun stuff, get out and get after cicadas.